Let us give thanks to he who walks behind the rose, who protects our crops. The God of sacrifice. The God who walked on the face of the earth. Let the harvest begin. So we are at the Flashback Weekends in Chicago, Illinois with John Franklin and Tim Sulka. John Franklin, of course, Isaac from Children of the Corn. Tim Sulka, writer of Children of the Corn 666. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Arnie. Nice to be here. Thank you, Arnie. Glad to be here. Now, John, Children of the Corn, we're on the 30th anniversary. Looking back at it, what is like your biggest takeaway and memory and the fact that the film has lasted for this long? It's really amazing, and, and truly the scary part is that 30 years have gone by, and that it's so fast, and you know, the parents always say, you know, once you're after 25, your know, life goes zipping by, and that's really true. And I know when you were making it that a lot of the budget was being cut out from under you guys and all of that. Could you ever have imagined when you had that movie making experience that that film would find the audience it did and endure the way it has? You know, I was so new to the business, it was my first feature film, so I really didn't have any kind of concept about longevity or how they would market it or anything like that. I was just so happy. I loved Stephen King always reading the novels and so it was just really cool to be in a Stephen King movie. And as young as you were, had you read Children of the Corn, the short story, before going into the movie? Yes, I read everything. My cousin Tim and I would swap back books, and I remember reading his copy of Carrie, and we'd swap back and forth, the, the, whatever was available up to that point. Okay, and so Tim, you're his cousin then, as well as his writing partner? Right, we're first cousins. His mother and my father are brother and sister. So, I found out when we were researching our retrospective that you two really were the genesis of Children of the Corn 666. It took a long time for the sequels to happen. They, the series remained dormant and then had a couple pseudo-theatrical sequels and then really went direct to video. How did you guys come up with the idea of Isaac's return and go about pitching that concept? Well, we did some research about who had the rights to it currently, and my agent for many years had been saying, get in there, you know, try to have Isaac come back, and it just seemed natural, and then when it ended up, we went in there and pitched it, and they're like, duh, this is a no-brainer, we got, of course we'll do it, and then I came up with the, it was number six at that point, so it's got to be 666. Right, yeah, we thought that this was the perfect time with the 666 and that in bringing his character back, we thought it would be a great way for Isaac to get revenge on the town and the people and who were now living in that life. And so we, we came up with that idea and pitched it and they were looking for a new idea for the series. So they uh, bought it and we were able to get it made in about six months. Yeah, I mean, it was great because the series had always been lacking kind of its Freddy Krueger, its face, and you were so memorable in that first film. How much did the end result of the film match the conception you had and the script that you wrote going in? <laughs> Completely different. The ending was written on the set. All of a sudden, they looked at the clock and they said, we've got to be out of this location in two hours or whatever. And so we had to rewrite the complete ending on the set. And it was, they said, 3 a.m., we are out of this location and the movie is over. So it's completely different. And it was, it was challenging because we did one version of the script that we gave to them and they said, just write what you want. We want to see what you can do. And then they said, well, we can't produce this because it was way over their budget. And so we really learned a lot about, you know, number of characters, number of locations. So it was an education for us also as screenwriters. And you guys are still writing together, right? Can you tell our listeners what your current project is? Yes, our current project is a graphic novel called Prime Cuts, which is a uh, modern-day retelling of the Sweeney Todd legend um, with teenagers. It's set in a strip mall with the hair salon next to a pizza parlor, so eventually um, the pizza toppings become you know, the victims of our character Todd Sweeney. So it's a kind of dark and uh, funny retelling of it. Um, that it's, it's a good for the modern age. And this is volume one of hopefully many more to come. So we had written the screenplay and then uh, Tim met some producers in New York that said, well, we can't afford to produce it, but let's make a graphic novel out of like the first 20 pages or so of the screenplay. So it's really cool seeing the transformation from a screenplay to a graphic novel. And the art is really cool too. Very nice. So how many volumes, assuming volume one is successful, would it take to tell the entire screenplay? 
at least four volumes, I think. It depends on how the story goes. We could always open it up and make it like a Walking Dead thing where it just kind of keeps going depending on the popularity of it. And hopefully we'll get a film or TV series made out of it as well if it gets you know, popular enough and there's a fan base created for it. But it's a fun, darkly comic retelling that um, I think will appeal to you know, mostly for adults. It's not. It's not for teenagers. It's not for kids. It's. It's for the over 18 crowd, definitely. And I'm just learning about this at the convention. But from the card you have here, is John in the comic as a character representation? Yes, uh, we decided to make one of the fun characters that works at the pizza parlor where the cannibalism happens. So that's you know, it's based on me, and so I'd love to play that part in the feature film. <laughs> Great, and where can people find the graphic novel? You can find the gra graphic novel, you can go to our website, which is primecutsnovel.com, and that'll take you directly to where you can buy it. You can also go to indieplanet.com, where hard copies are available for sale, and you can also download the first volume uh, for 99 cents. All right, guys, thank you very much for the time. Great to meet you both, and I look forward to checking out that graphic novel. Great, thank you so much for this. Thank you very much, Arnie. Come to NowPlayingPodcast.com each week as we review another film based on Stephen King's books and short stories. This is the word of he who walks by in the rose. We do this word for Shiny Shadow. At our sister podcast, BooksAndNachos.com, you can hear Arnie's reviews of the original Stephen King books and short stories on which these films are based. You should look it up. You still remember how to read, don't you? In the NowPlayingPodcast.com archives, you can find many more reviews of Stephen King films, including Maximum Overdrive, The Mangler, Sometimes They Come Back, The Lawnmower Man, Carrie, Salem's Lot, The Shining, and more. Find dozens of Stephen King movie reviews at NowPlayingPodcast.com. Movies are filled with violence.